Today on Green Country People and Places. The Sepulpa Historical Museum is set up to protect, preserve, and present the history of the city of Sepulpa. The Adelaide Lodge Museum is the vision of Mary Stone McClendon. Her idea was to create a setting to teach American Indian arts and crafts. This exhibit is all about what was happening with life in Tulsa in the 1930s. Oklahoma's Green Country. It's full of unique places. and interesting people. This is a great place to come if you're a Leon nut. I feel like I should have pointy ears looking through this. So come along with us. This thing's huge. <laughs> and enjoy the ride. The Sepulpa Historical Museum is uh, set up to protect, preserve, and present the history of the city of Sepulpa. We use artifacts uh, to create displays to show people what it was like in early Sepulpa. And since history is ongoing, we continually have to update and change and add you know, new items to because now the 1950s and the 1960s are also history. And, and oh, don't make me feel that old, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, right off the bat, when you walk in, you see the General Mercantile. Uh, what's this all about? Well, John F. Egan and two of his brothers came here in the 1890s and set up a store here in Sepulpa, one in Tulsa and one in Kellyville. And uh, he became one of our first postmaster. The first post office was in his store. And then, unfortunately, his store burned down. Uh, and he got into buying and selling properties and, and became our first city clerk and was very involved in the development of the city of Oklahoma. His grandson has written a couple of books. He's our local historian, has written yeah. a couple of books about Zapalpa, and he's done some of the dioramas that we'll see as we go through the museum today. And so this would be considered a diorama. It shows you, it was a diorama, a big it's, thing or a little thing? Well, a diorama is really more of a, a model. So is this, this like this, a bigger rama? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a, a set that we set up to show some of the things. It has some of the type of items, the old scale and the cash register. Uh, he was our first postmaster, so there was a little mailbox slots uh, over here. And some of the items that were sold, and of course a lot of things were, you know, in canning jars, which Sepulpa produced, uh, and they had a glass plant that produced uh, canning jars. Really? Yes. Many months have come and gone since I wandered from my home In the Oklahoma hills where I was born Many a page of life has turned, many a lesson I have learned But I feel that in those hills I still belong This is really cool. You have a lot of stuff built. I mean, <laughs> it's not like going in and looking at things behind a glass case, really. Yeah, we try to display things, and we've been lucky that a lot of people have left us artifacts, you know, and so we've been able to fill up the museum with uh, gifts and donations from uh, the local citizens. This area over here, uh, we show all our early schools and talk about the, the school buildings and the, some of the people who went to school here. And in this area, we talk about our uh, train depot and the railroad, which was the foundation of the town. We grew up around. Fantastic photo you have there. Yeah, that was, it was a great old depot uh, built in 1907, and we have a bench that was out of it, and one of these carts that was used in the. Uh, for real, the, I mean, this really came from it. That, I mean, that's so correct. many cities lose their history. You guys have a whole city of pack rats, don't you? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> it has been said, and they've been generous in sharing with us. Is this a this is a diorama? This right? is a diorama showing <laughs> what the train yard looked like in 1917. It stretched about six blocks, had a roundhouse and a turntable, and uh, it was uh, the main foundation of our early economy. So I mean, certainly that, until the 20s. That was a big facility for what we think of now as a small town. Yes, at, at the time, Sepulpa was not that small a town. When we incorporated in 1898, about three months behind Tulsa, we were within a hundred people or so of Tulsa and they went actually one of the main things was when this railroad moved to Tulsa in the late 20s you know Tulsa's population you know grew mm -hmm. 
quite a bit after that and are stabilized or they actually shrunk for a bit. As I turn life a page to the land of the great Osage in the Oklahoma hills where I was born where the black hole rolls and flows and the snow white cotton grows in the Oklahoma hills where I was born. So you have a story about these desks don't you? Well, yes, these desks were used uh, all the way up into the, the mid-1950s. Uh, I actually sat in desks like this my first and second grade at a school called uh, Forest Park. Can you uh, imagine either of us ever fitting back in the desks we used to sit <laughs> no, in? <laughs> no, but some of these desks are from the Ouchi Mission School. Uh, and one of them, if you'll notice, is a left-handers, which was really kind of unusual for that period of time for them to make that accommodation for yeah, someone who's left. That was a sin back then. Yes. So uh, the schools in uh, Sepulpa, you had some amazing buildings in the beginning, but then the Depression and the war kind of affected that, right? Yes, there was hardly any materials or money to update them. So in the 1950s, when our economy got a lot better, they replaced them with the one-story ranch-style buildings that we used until just about 10 years ago when they started uh, building the newer generation of, of school building here and down. I see pancakes out, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a nice display. Well, did you and set this up to show people what it was like way back when Sepulpa first started up? Yes, yeah, some of the equipment and the, the accommodations that they had to make for the time, like the Hoosier cabinet over there. Which one's that? That's this one over here. Yeah. And if you had a one or two room cabin and several children, you know, this was a way of grouping all of your kitchen stuff into one area. This drawer right here is a metal line with a sifter down here so that you would just sift out the flour as you wanted it. And then you've got your coffee grinder and your meat grinder, uh, your butter churns up there so that you, you know, took the milk and created butter and then what you didn't need for your family, you took to Mr. Egan in town and swapped it out for something that you couldn't produce yourself. You had to be kind of organized to work in such a small space, I imagine. <laughs> yes, and mostly it was an all-day thing. Uh, you get up early and produce uh, breakfast for the family, and then uh, they would go work out in your uh, farm. And by the time you got cleaned up, it was time to get started and go out and get some wood for the fire. This building goes on and on and on. What was it originally? It was originally the Lee Hotel, uh, built in 1910 and then became the YWCA in the mid-1920s and stayed that way until they gave it to the Historical Society in the mid-1980s. Goodness, and, and you have filled up every single one of these rooms with something different, haven't you? We've themed them all out, trying to take the opportunity to show uh, a different segment of what life was like in early Sepulpa. And they range from what to what? Uh, well, we have some dealing with the uh, uh, early Uchi and Creek Indians, and then we have a military room. This is really impressive. What is this? <laughs> this is a diorama of Sepulpa in 1929. 1929? So, yes, it was a pretty good sized town. And it was really com competing with Tulsa as far as population and area, right? Early, early on, they, they were pretty close and they grew together. Um, until about this time and Tulsa grew much larger. You know, after that the depression and losing the railroad yard uh, yeah. made quite a bit of difference in Sepulpa's economy. Now this just aren't, uh, aren't, isn't. These aren't just little cardboard cutouts thrown around, right? This is pretty accurate. No, yeah, this is metal and it's, it's done to scale. Uh, he had access to the insurance records which showed the height of buildings, the thickness of walls, and, and so He's done a, a marvelous job with this. Egan, what was his name? Uh, Pete Egan. Pete Egan. Last year's Sepulpa Citizen of the Year, by the way. I would think so. Yeah. And you spend four years on this. Yeah, he spent he a little four years. He did other dioramas for the museum. Yeah, the one of the train station, the way it looked like in 1917, uh, Pete did that one for us as well. And then one of uh, early Sepulpa, 1895. Of course, that didn't take very long because there wasn't much here in 1895. Well, this is an impressive place. I imagine you guys are pretty proud of your museum. Very proud. The, the people who have put this together have done a nice job, and it's a pleasure to get to show it.
You are in the Adelaide Lodge Museum here at Bacon College, part of the historic campus of Bacon College. The Adelaide Lodge Museum was completed in 1932. It is the vision of a young woman named Mary Stone McClendon. She was a member of the Chickasaw Nation. Her idea was to create a, a setting to teach American Indian arts and crafts. This is really spectacular looking and very old looking. What do we have here? Well, this is probably some of the first items to be included into the Adelaide Lodge Museum collection. Um, these were the, the property of Reverend Joseph Murrow, one of the three founders of Bacon College. So these are Apache? Uh, those uh, are Apache water jars. And this and is a uh, woven Yes, basket. that is also a pattern. The fact that that still exists is amazing. You know, that's an excellent point. The, you know, the museum is not um, airtight as most museums are. You know, mm -hmm. It wasn't built as a museum. It was built as a cultural center, basically. But yet, everything here is in really great shape. And uh, one of our employees here, Rosanna Spink, she's been on campus 50 years. She calls it blessed. Everything in here has a blessing <laughs> to it. And so it's... Uh, it's able to maintain its integrity. But these are absolutely priceless, right? Uh, pri definitely to us. That's, I'm sure there's, a, insurance wise, there's a value to them, <laughs> but uh, they're, they're definitely priceless to us. Now this area is an educational area in terms, of it's kind of showing how you get dyes and make the wool for your blankets and rugs and things. Yes, this uh, Navajo rug on the floor that you see, this ha gets a lot of attention. I didn't um, even notice it. I know, that, that, that's, that's uh, it, we get, when students or visitors stop in, they you know it becomes they become aware of it, and then they uh, become more fascinated as this as we we're able to uh, give information on it. Well, it's, it's huge. Yeah, it, it's large, and it was the largest made by one person. One person in history at the time. At the time, it was the, in the United States. It was recorded as the largest made by one person. What time was and, that? The way and it was in the 1940s. Wow. 1940s, and it was a purchase by the college to for the students to walk across during the commencement exercises and um, the story goes is that they uh, the, the maker they uh, people from Bacon went and, uh, to uh, the Navajo reservation and when they wanted to purchase it they they could only give five hundred dollars the maker wanted one thousand dollars of course which was a lot of money at the time and uh, of course, and so was $500, but $500 is all that, you know, Bacon could afford it in those days. And so um, they were able to negotiate. The story goes they negotiated all day until $500 was the set amount. In addition to the artifacts and things, the architecture here is wonderful and this fireplace really stands out. Why is it so special looking? Other than its size, it's, it's a, a huge fireplace. It's 500 stones. This was the idea of Benjamin Weeks, who was then president of Bacon College. Um, the idea was to have, the original idea was to have one stone from every turquoise mine in the Southwest. Okay, so he goes to New York State where the American Baptist Church home offices were, and to sell this idea. Okay, they love the idea of this huge fireplace. And so, but they ask, would you include a stone from New York State? He says, we'll go find one of historic significance, and if you could add that to your fireplace, that would just be great. And so, uh, President Benjamin Weeks says, you know, great, that's no problem. So, upon his return to Oklahoma, it dawns on him, he says, well, why don't I get a stone from every state? in the United States and add those. And so a letter writing campaign was established and uh, you know of course they didn't have the UPS trucks or, <laughs> or uh, any type of other mail. Most people would hand deliver them, you know, drive them. Students would bring them into the college and uh, you know this was completed in 1932. That's really wild because every stone really has a story behind it. It's just not something that was just picked out of the ground to make something with. Yeah, some of those are actually from uh, historic homes. You know, from either the yard of a historic site, or a, um, uh, or in some cases, the actual a brick from or a, a rock from a historic uh, location, historic building structure. Is that a dinosaur footprint? It is indeed. Whenever I began here at the Adelaide Lodge Museum, the original um, description was it was a, a T-Rex footprint. Fortunately for me. Uh, working here 13 years now, eventually a paleontologist enters doing some research just passing through 
And I was able to ask him, I said, is that a T-Rex footprint? And he said, no, it's not even a baby T-Rex. He said, but, but it is a typical meat eater. He says, we don't know what kind, uh, what type of footprint, but it is a meat eater, a meat eater of some type. Dinosaurs lived a long time ago. They were terrible lizards, don't you know? Some ate plants and some ate meat. Some ate fish and some ate beets. So you don't just represent one tribe, you represent a lot of tribes, and this room's kind of a good example, right? This is a great example of using this room. It's intertribal. You know, we use that uh, in powwows a lot, but it's an intertribal collection. Uh, we have from, you know, Cherokee items here, then we go to Northwest Coast items, which, you know, you don't see, you know, in museums in Oklahoma very much. So you're talking Alaska? Uh, Alaska. Um, this, uh, this one is one of my favorites. This is probably one, uh, um, is the potlatch carved food dish. That's really it's unique from, looking. It's from 1921. It's, so it's carved from wood? It's carved from wood. And this is the actual, um, you know, we all grew up hearing the term potluck, uh -huh. potluck dinner. Of course, that's where the, the potlatch ceremony, you know, these using these food dishes, you know, there's a long history of uh, the, the potlatch ceremony, but that was the where we get potluck from, the potluck dinner. A carved food dish like this was used to bring food, and of course it was a big giveaway, you know, uh, uh, the potluck potlatch ceremony was a huge giveaway. People give away food, So everyone in the tribe would get together almost like a party yeah, and they'd yeah, each bring a dish. Celebration, you yeah. bet. Mm -hmm. What's this big box behind you? Well, that's what I thought when I started here. Now I'd seen them before, but exactly I needed some more detail to it. Um, whenever I began here, I lifted the lid and you know, to look inside, see, I was going to see if there was anything inside. Mm -hmm. And um, it smelled like fish. Yeah, you know, it smelled like it smelled like a salmon or halibut. So, uh, and I, so I knew it was used, and of course, did some more research. This was, you know, your typical. Um, usually, they're bent wood. This one has some nails. You know, it has some uh, has a seam there, but um, it's also they, decorated too. I noticed. Yeah, these images are uh, typical of the, uh, the the religious aspect of Northwest Coast. They they believe that there's a a, a higher deity for people, and there's a higher deity for um, for animals, and so this being used to carry the animals, mm -hmm. you know, fish. Um, so it's for storage and transportation. For storage and transportation, uh, that you know they would paint the you know and still do these still done today, um, paint the image of a deity of that for the animal okay. world. I bet I can guess who made this one. Is this a Willard Stone? It is indeed. This is the great Willard Stone, one of his uh, beautiful works of art. He was a student of Bacon College. He really? Was a, yes, indeed. He was a, a student of A.C. Blue Eagle. And uh, he was a 19-year-old young man on Bacon College campus. And, of course, he had talent already. You know, uh, uh, he was exceptional. But uh, he was able to hone those skills here at Bacon College. Now, A.C. Blue Eagle was the first superstar Native American artist, right? And you have some of his work here. And he actually was part of the college? Very much part of the college. He was the founding director of the American Indian Art Program here at Bacon College. Uh, you know, there, um, it was the first art program with an American Indian instructor. And so we were very proud of that. And, you know, we try to teach our students who A.C. Blue Eagle is, try to keep his name a lot. Because he was known worldwide. I mean, he traveled and met kings and queens and everybody, right? He was, he was, the, he was the big guy. He was the Will Rogers of mm -hmm. the Native American group, right? That's a good comparison. You bet. Yeah. He was a, uh, yeah, and we're very fortunate to have these. Believe it or not, this, this came to us relatively late, this collection of, of tumblers. You know, I've spoken with volunteers in the in museum and they say these were everywhere at one time. But, of course, they're getting scarce now. But this is the entire set. Um, the story goes is that when you got a, a, a fill-up at a Knox oil gas station, uh, $10 or a fill-up, you would receive one of these tumblers. Whoa. And then eventually you would uh, ride off and send for the tray. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is, a, like I say, a complete set. And I'm very fortunate to have those.
back at one of our favorite places, the Tulsa Historical Society. And Maggie, I see we're in a different decade, the same room we were in before, but it's moved on upward, hasn't it? That's right. Now we are in the 1930s, and this exhibit is all about what was happening with life in Tulsa in the 1930s. So while the entire country was suffering from the Great Depression, and in fact the entire world was going through a depression at the time, this talks about specifically what was happening in Tulsa. And Tulsa was having a hard time, wasn't it? Absolutely. The end of the 20s. The 20s was a booming decade everywhere and especially in Tulsa with the oil boom. But at the end of the decade, there is a huge oil discovery in East Texas that basically eclipses all of the other oil wells in the country. That one discovery produces more oil than every place else in the country combined. And so that makes the cost, the price of oil plummet. And the price of oil goes from $1.30 a barrel in 1929 to 10 cents a barrel by 1933. And throw on top of that the Great Depression, it is just bad. Right, so lots of bad things kind of pile up and Tulsa is hit especially hard because of the oil industry. Despite all the troubles, there was beauty all around though. Art Deco was thriving at that time, wasn't it? Absolutely. Lots of things were beginning to look more and more what we consider modern. And so Art Deco was one of those things. Art Deco started in the 20s with cities, especially Tulsa, which was booming at that era, wanting to make sure everyone knew it was a big city and it was modern. And it continues on into the 30s. And so we have lots of beautiful Art Deco pieces, including some radios that are playing radio shows from the 1930s. And we even have some chairs so people can sit down and listen to the radio shows just like they might have been sitting in their living room. And that was super important during that time. This is their only connection to the rest of the United States, except for a newspaper, right? Uh, this is immediate. That's right. So there's no TV. People aren't watching the news there. So they're getting their news via radio. The president had fireside chats all the time to update the country on what was happening with relief, with the depression. And then there were lots of other entertaining shows. So we have some Will Rogers shows and there are all sorts of things that people sat in their living rooms and listened together as a family. This particular evening, October 30th, the Crosley Service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radio. War of the Worlds. This is a nice yes. display you have. What's going on? Well, in the 1930s, there was no TV, and so people gathered around their radios to listen to news shows and also to listen to entertainment. And so this radio from the 1930s is playing some of those 1930s radio shows. And it includes some of the presidents, um, FDR's fireside chats, as well as some Will Rogers radio shows. And right now, we're listening, oh, maybe I shouldn't say right now. <laughs> and more of the world. <laughs> One thing I'm impressed with too, Tulsa is well known for Art Deco, and these also have Art Deco styles. Absolutely. Right? So many things were influenced by Art Deco between 1920 and 1950. It wasn't just about architecture. So people's, um, people's furniture was Art Deco, people's clothes had Art Deco influences, all sorts of things were Art Deco inspired. <laughs> This is old, but it looks very familiar. It does look familiar. A lot of people remember this counter and soda fountain from being at Steve Sundry. Okay, I gotcha. So many people have sat in these very chairs and had a drink or a sandwich. No, it's not here because Steve's closed. It's here because it's even older than Steve. That's right. This was originally used in Quaker Drug that was located at 18th and Baltimore in the 1930s. So it's from the very end of the 1930s, although it had been used in Steve's for 50 years. And what you have in front of you is the old soda fountain. That's right. So we have lots of flavors. Plain cherry, chocolate, root beer, and Dr. Pepper. So you're using electronics more and more to help teach, right? We are. We like to have lots of interactive things in our museum. And this is our new virtual exhibit about the 1921 race riot. And it's actually an app that people can purchase so that they can look through information in their homes and researchers can have access to it. So and basically every single item in our collection that is related to the race riot, whether it's a photograph, a newspaper clipping, or an artifact, is here for people to look at the original copy and the information we have about it. And there are hundreds and hundreds of items that are included in this virtual exhibit. This is our new exhibit about the history of the Greenwood area in Tulsa. Greenwood was one of the most prosperous African-American neighborhoods and communities in the entire country in the teens and 20s, and it began in 1905, and then of course was completely destroyed by the race riot in 1921, but then rebuilt in an amazing way so that it was sort of back to where it had been 
very quickly after the race riot and again continued its prosperity for several more decades. It's amazing because it's kind of a very well kept secret. I think even to some people who just moved here, they don't realize how prosperous the community was and what a rarity that was. That's right. And it was, it was very prosperous. There were lots of businesses. There were lots of professionals, lawyers, doctors, all sorts of people that lived in the area and just brought in lots of money. And it was a very well supported community. And no good story about Tulsa can't go without having an oil display, right? That's absolutely right. And this particular exhibit is a collection of early oil field scenes that came from postcards. And so we've taken the original postcards, blown up the images so people can see what early oil field life looked like. And these are also rare because a number of the communities included in these images no longer exist. That's interesting. And I really like the fact, I mean, honestly, this probably won't be here by the time you see this on the air because you keep changing over this, we these displays do. Each on a regular of our, basis. Each of our galleries changes at least once a year. And so things change all the time. There's always something new to see. And so this may be gone. Well, that's why we like coming back coming. here because it changes so often that a lot of people don't get to come down here on a regular basis. So we get to show you a peek at what's going on. So this is a great place to come. I really appreciate you letting us come around and look around again. Well, thanks for coming back. <laughs>